You're listening to the Anesthesia Patient Safety Podcast, the official podcast of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. We're bringing you the very best from the APSF newsletter and website, as well as the latest information in perioperative patient safety. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to the Anesthesia Patient Safety Podcast. My name is Allie Bechtel, and I'm your host. Thank you for joining us for another show. We have a very special show for you today. In August 2022, we released a two-part podcast series on the updated 2022 American Society of Anesthesiologists Guidelines for Difficult Airway Management. The episodes are some of our most popular. We are putting the series together into one great show to review the difficult airway guidelines with key considerations for keeping patients safe. Before we dive into the episode today, we'd like to recognize Edwards Life Sciences, a major corporate supporter of APSF. Edwards Life Sciences has generously provided unrestricted support to further our vision that no one shall be harmed by anesthesia care. Thank you, Edwards Life Sciences. We wouldn't be able to do all that we do without you. One of the 10 APSF patient safety priorities is airway management, including airway management difficulties, skills, and equipment. This topic is near and dear to the hearts and clinical practice of all anesthesia professionals and is a critical part of keeping patients safe during anesthesia care. Our featured article is from the June 2022 APSF newsletter article by John Fiaggio and David Mercier. Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation Update, 2022 American Society of Anesthesiologists Practice Guidelines for Management of the Difficult Airway. To follow along with us, head over to APSF.org and click on the newsletter heading. Fifth one down is Newsletter Archives. Click on June 2022, then scroll down until you get to our featured article today. I will include a link to this article in the show notes as well. Today, We are returning to episodes number 113 and 114. Here we go. The TLDR of these revised guidelines is consideration for continued oxygen delivery throughout difficult airway management and during extubation, as well as using capnography for confirmation of successful tracheal intubation. But we are not going to stop there. We are getting into all of the details of the airway management algorithm, so don't touch that dial. Another important consideration for these new guidelines is the focus on paying attention to the passage of time while performing airway management. This is important because during critical situations, there may be a tendency towards task fixation with multiple failed attempts at the same approach without considering alternative techniques. This puts the patient at increased risk of airway trauma and persistent failure to secure the airway. This is a call for increased situational awareness while working through the airway algorithm, which may even mean that you end up at the surgical airway pathway earlier. One option is to assign the role of arbiter of task fixation to a member of the healthcare team who is not involved in hands-on airway management to help guide the healthcare team through the difficult airway algorithm. A threat to patient safety that was identified since the previous guidelines were published is judgment error in not performing an awake intubation when it is indicated, which has led to complications and failure to secure the airway. As a result, the updated guidelines include a pre-induction decision chart for awake compared to asleep airway management. Check out figure one in the article, and we are going through it as well. It is important to consider an awake intubation for adult patients in the following situations. Difficult ventilation, either face mask or supraglottic airway. Increased risk of aspiration. Intolerance of brief apnea, 
and expected difficulty with emergency invasive airway access. Let's go through part one now. This is the pre-airway management decision-making tool, which can be used when deciding between securing the airway awake or post-induction. First, do you suspect difficult laryngoscopy or intubation with direct or a video laryngoscope? If the answer is no, then you may proceed to part three, an airway management with induction. But the chart reminds us that any single factor may be enough of an indication for securing the airway awake. And don't forget about additional considerations, including the patient's ability to cooperate and hemodynamic stability. Now, if the answer to that first question was yes, there is a series of three additional questions. Number one, do you suspect difficult ventilation with face mask or supraglottic device? Number two, is there a significantly increased risk for aspiration? And number three, is there an increased risk for rapid desaturation? If the answer is yes to any of these questions, then proceed to part two, awake airway management. If the answer is no, then continue to the next question in the series. If you made it through all three additional questions with no answers, then you can proceed to part three and airway management with induction. But don't forget to evaluate for emergency invasive airway as well. Next up, let's review part two of the chart and awake airway management. The first step here is to review the airway strategy for awake airway management. It is up to the airway manager to complete an assessment and decide on equipment and technique for awake airway management based on previous experience, available resources, including equipment, and the availability and competency of help, and the clinical context. Awake airway management may include flexible fiber optic intubation scope, video laryngoscopy, direct laryngoscopy, supraglottic airway, combined devices, and retrograde wire aided. Here are some important considerations for keeping patients safe during an awake intubation. Anatomical and physiologic airway difficulty risk, aspiration risk, infection risk, other exposure risk, equipment and monitoring check, role assignment, and backup and rescue plans. Now, we are proceeding with awake airway management. It is important to deliver oxygen and optimize oxygenation throughout the procedure. This may include low or high flow nasal oxygen, head elevated positioning, and non-invasive ventilation during pre-oxygenation. The first branch point is an awake technique or an elective invasive airway. An invasive airway may include surgical cricothyroidotomy, needle cricothyroidotomy with a pressure regulated device, large bore cannula cricothyroidotomy, or surgical tracheostomy, as well as retrograde wire-guided intubation and percutaneous tracheostomy. There are rare situations where rigid bronchoscopy or ECMO may be options as well. Keeping patients safe during elective invasive airways also means that this procedure is performed by someone trained in the invasive airway technique whenever possible. At this point, either awake intubation or elective invasive airway, if the procedure is successful, then it is critical to confirm placement and ensure adequate ventilation with capnography. What do you do if the awake intubation is unsuccessful? This is the time to consider calling for help, and you can proceed to the awake non-emergency pathway. This pathway includes either postponing the procedure or consider the risks and benefits of the following. An alternative awake technique. An awake elective invasive airway. Alternative anesthetic techniques. And finally, if the patient is unstable or if airway management is absolutely necessary after a failed awake intubation, then this is the time to proceed with induction of anesthesia with preparations for possible emergency invasive airway. We are moving on to part three of the chart. This is airway management with induction of anesthesia. Remember, throughout these steps, it is important to deliver oxygen and optimize oxygenation to help keep patients safe. The first step here is to review the airway management strategy. This is such an important step during awake or asleep airway management and includes deciding on the technique for securing the airway based on the airway manager's choice of technique and experiences, 
the patient, the procedure, and the available equipment. The next step is pre-oxygenation and induction of anesthesia. Now, was your airway plan successful? If it was, then confirm adequate ventilation with capnography and proceed as planned. If the airway plan was unsuccessful, are you able to provide adequate ventilation? Let's go through the yes, adequate ventilation by face mask or supraglottic airway pathway first. You will want to consider calling for help at this point. You are now on the non-emergency pathway with a goal to establish a secure airway. The chart includes a cycle with less than or equal to 3 plus 1, stay time, attempt, and SpO2 aware in the middle, and three options of used alternative device, awake patient, and invasive airway. The less than or equal to 3 plus 1 refers to limiting attempts at tracheal intubation and supraglottic airway insertion to decrease the risk for bleeding, edema, and airway trauma, which may lead to increased difficulty with mask ventilation or securing the airway. Keep in mind that persistent attempts at any airway intervention, even inadequate mask ventilation, may lead to a delay in an emergency invasive airway and increased risk for complications. The approach here is to limit attempts with any technique class, that is face mask, supraglottic airway, tracheal tube, to three attempts and reserve one attempt for a clinician with higher skills, hence three plus one. As you work through the non-emergency pathway to secure the airway, it is critical to make sure that you are providing adequate ventilation. As long as you are, then you remain on the non-emergency pathway. Alternative devices may include supraglottic airway, direct laryngoscopy, video laryngoscopy, and flexible fiber optic scope. In addition, when you are on the non-emergency pathway, you still have the option to awaken the patient, and this may be a life-saving decision. When deciding to awaken the patient and postpone the case and intubation, the goal is to bring the patient back with appropriate resources the next time to be successful in the future, including personnel, equipment, patient preparation, or planned awake intubation. And now we are returning to episode number 114. So keep those seat belts buckled. We are going to pick back up where we left off in part three. This is airway management with induction of anesthesia. The first step is to review the airway management strategy. This is such an important step during awake or asleep airway management and includes deciding on the technique for securing the airway based on the airway manager's choice of techniques and experiences, the patient, the procedure, and the available equipment. The next step is pre-oxygenation and induction of anesthesia. Now, was your airway plan successful? If it was, then confirm adequate ventilation with capnography and proceed as planned. If the airway plan was unsuccessful, are you able to provide adequate ventilation? Last week, we went through the yes, adequate ventilation by face mask or supraglottic airway pathway. This week, we are headed over to the emergency pathway. Your heart rate may be increasing right now, and you will notice that on the chart, this pathway is highlighted in red, which means that at this time, adequate ventilation is not possible. This is the time to call for help. The priority is to establish the ability to ventilate. Once again, on the chart, there is the less than or equal to 3 plus 1 in the middle of a cycle with three options, including face mask, supraglottic airway, and tracheal tube. For the less than or equal to 3 plus 1, this represents limiting the total number of attempts or alternative techniques and optimizing the patient in between attempts and avoiding task fixation. It is critical not to continue with the same technique that did not work on earlier attempts because this may lead to increased risk for bleeding, edema, and airway trauma which may further increase the difficulty of mask ventilation and securing the airway. The approach suggested here is to limit attempts with any technique class, including face mask, supraglottic airway, and tracheal tube to three, and then reserving one additional attempt by a clinician with higher skills. <laughs> 
in between each attempt, it is so important to optimize the patient, which may include suction, muscle relaxants, and repositioning. During face mask ventilation, you may need an oral or nasal airway or two-handed mask grip to establish ventilation. When placing a supraglottic airway, optimization may include evaluating the device size, design, and even first-generation compared to second-generation devices. In addition, you will want to consider a supraglottic airway with intubating capability for either the initial or rescue supraglottic device. If ventilation with this supraglottic device is then successful, then you will move back over to the non-emergency pathway and have the option for securing the airway with an endotracheal tube through the supraglottic device. Other considerations for the option of placing an endotracheal tube is to use video laryngoscopy for the initial or rescue tracheal intubation. Between each attempt, it is important to assess ventilation with capnography, and if you establish adequate ventilation, then you can move over to the non-emergency pathway and work through the algorithm to establish the secure airway or awaken the patient. If you progress through the emergency pathway and ventilation remains inadequate, this is the time for an emergency invasive airway. Options may include surgical cricothyrotomy, needle cricothyrotomy with a pressure-regulated device, large bore cannula cricothyrotomy, or surgical tracheostomy. In rare clinical cases, rigid bronchoscopy and ECMO may be required. Keep in mind that the emergency invasive airway should be obtained by an individual with appropriate training in the invasive airway techniques whenever possible. After establishing an emergency invasive airway, it is important to ensure adequate ventilation and confirm with capnography. Additional considerations for postoperative care depend on the patient and procedure as well as the airway access and may include steroids, racemic epinephrine, counseling for the patient, documentation in the medical record, team debriefing, and encouraging patient difficulty airway registry. Phew! We made it through the adult difficult airway management algorithms. Do you do timeout procedures prior to an anticipated difficult airway? This is an important step while working to keep patients safe during this critical time. The airway management timeout should be completed prior to proceeding with securing the airway or induction of anesthesia. The timeout should include role identification including the primary airway manager, the backup airway manager, the required equipment and any backup equipment, and the person available for help. Now we are moving on to one of the brand new sections for the guidelines, and this is the pediatric algorithm. Here we go. You can find the pediatric algorithm in the article, and I will include it in the show notes as well. There are three main tools to help with the difficult airway management in a child. Number one, the supraglottic airway. Number two, flexible intubation scope. And number three, the video laryngoscope. Keep in mind that these devices may be combined during airway management if you are unsuccessful with the individual devices. In addition, it is important to ensure adequate ventilation in between attempts to secure the airway. And when ventilation is easy, you can utilize these devices or a combination of devices to secure the airway. If you are unable to establish adequate ventilation, then this becomes the priority and options include face mask, supraglottic airway device, adjuncts, and the best attempt to perform tracheal intubation with the technique that is most likely to be successful. Once again, it is vital to limit the number of attempts. A difference in the pediatric algorithm is the importance of determining if an obstruction is functional or anatomical because the treatments are different. For functional obstructions, medication administration is necessary to break a laryngospasm or bronchospasm. For an anatomical obstruction, airway devices including oropharyngeal, nasopharyngeal, and supraglottic airway devices may be required for treatment. Following securing the airway or emergence, a team debrief is an important part of the difficult man airway management algorithm to discuss lessons learned, express difficult emotions, and identify areas for improvement in the future. We are going to go through the difficult airway infographic for pediatric patients. Here are some of the highlights to be on the lookout for. <music> 
early considerations for ECMO in pediatric airway management. Airway management after inhaled induction of anesthesia is common for pediatric patients, while awake intubation is much less common. Importance of maintaining adequate depth of anesthesia with ventilation assessment after every intubation attempt. Goal to minimize total number of attempts. Rigid bronchoscopy may be considered by a clinician trained with this device for rescue. And be careful with airway exchange catheters because there is an increased risk for pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum if the catheter perforates the airway and a smaller margin for error in pediatric patients. Let's work our way through the infographic now. The first step is the timeout to identify the plan for airway management with a team-based approach. It is important to assign the following, the primary airway manager, the backup manager, the primary equipment and backup equipment, and the person or people to call for help. In certain situations when non-invasive airway management is likely to fail, it is necessary to contact an ECMO team or ENT surgeon to assist. This may be for patients with congenital high airway obstruction or an airway tumor. After the timeout and proceeding with your airway management plan, if you were successful, then you may continue as planned. If your initial airway management plan was unsuccessful, are you able to provide adequate oxygenation and ventilation? If the answer is yes, then you stay on the green non-emergency pathway. Make sure that you continue to deliver oxygen throughout the airway management procedure and consider calling for help. The next attempt should be with the technique or device most familiar to the primary airway manager, which may include a supraglottic device, video laryngoscope, flexible bronchoscopy, or a combination of these devices. Other techniques may include lighted stylet or rigid stylet, depending on the clinician preference. Make sure that you optimize patients in between attempts with alternative devices as needed and assess ventilation after each attempt. Once again, it is critical to limit the number of attempts with the following strategy. One attempt at direct laryngoscopy with consideration for video laryngoscopy instead of a direct laryngoscopy attempt, making sure that the total attempts by the primary airway manager is only three, with one additional attempt by a secondary airway manager. Then, after four attempts, consideration for emerging the patient and reversing anesthetic drugs if possible. Further attempts to secure the airway may be considered only if the risks and benefits to the patient favor continued attempts at airway management. What if you are unable to provide adequate oxygenation or ventilation? Now you are on the marginal or emergency pathway. This is the time to call for help. The first step is to treat any functional or anatomical obstruction. Next, attempt to improve ventilation with face mask, tracheal intubation, and supraglottic device. If these devices and attempts fail, then you need to consider emerging the patient as long as you are able to provide some oxygenation and ventilation or proceeding with advanced invasive airway techniques, which may include rigid bronchoscopy, emergency invasive airway, or ECMO. After all cases of difficult airway management, it is important to conduct a team debrief. This will help to highlight what went well during the procedure, what areas need improvement, and to provide emotional support to team members, especially if there's a patient morbidity or mortality. As we begin to wrap up for today, we are returning to the article to discuss updates to the guidelines related to devices and technology. The use of a video laryngoscope for patients with an anticipated difficult airway has been shown to provide a better laryngeal view and improved first attempt success compared to direct laryngoscopy in several meta-analyses with equivocal results comparing video-assisted laryngoscopy to flexible intubation scopes. In addition, studies have revealed equivocal results for hyperangulated video laryngoscopes compared to non-angulated video laryngoscopes in patients with anticipated difficult airways. The combination of techniques may be helpful as well, such as using a flexible intubation scope through a supraglottic airway, which had a higher first attempt success rate than using the flexible intubation scope alone. 
After securing the airway for a patient with a difficult airway, extubation is another critical time because you do not want to have to re-intubate the patient if at all possible. Make sure you have a clear extubation plan in place with a strategy for re-intubation if necessary. Your plan will depend on the healthcare team members, the extubation location, and available equipment. You may want to leave an airway exchange catheter in place or consider placing a laryngeal mask for possible rapid re-intubation. Keeping patients safe following difficult airway management depends on clear documentation of how the airway was secured in the medical record, which may then be used for future airway management procedures. Patients will need this information as well in the form of a letter for their records, and they should be encouraged to register with an emergency notification service. If you have any questions or comments from today's show, please email us at podcast at APSF.org. Please keep in mind that the information in this show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute medical or legal advice. We hope that you will visit APSF.org for detailed information and check out the show notes for links to all the topics we discussed today. Have you joined the conversation on Twitter? If so, we would love for you to tag us in a tweet at APSF.org using the hashtag, hashtag APSF podcast, and tell us your favorite show or what you want to hear about on a future show. Thanks for listening, and we can't wait to hear from you. Until next time, stay vigilant so that no one shall be harmed by anesthesia care.